All right, uh, let's get started today, Wednesday. It is Wednesday, right? Good. Yes. Uh, any questions on Project 3? Do like two or three minutes, Project 3 questions. Yeah. Um, what would you suggest for, um, I passed all of my local test cases, but only like 90% of the ones on the server, so I have no idea where to start it. But. Uh, so, what do you mean local test cases? Well, the ones that were given to us, the six or seven test cases. Yeah, the shell script one. Yeah, the shell script. I passed all of those. <coughs> Create test cases. One way to do it is to take the example from the site itself, right? Take that, create test cases for that test case. Um, you want to look at how. Uh, so I would do two things. A, create test cases, right? So uh, try to look at the test cases that you have, look at other test cases, and try to think, okay, what types of grammars is this not testing, right? Is there uh, say a grammar with maybe like an infinite loop or something, or what would be an infinite loop, right? Something like uh, it should be treated as an infinite loop. In the business of unplugging and plugging things in. Okay, there you go. Uh, something like I don't know. S goes to A. S goes to B, A goes to, I don't know, A little A, uh, B, or no, I would do A goes to S A, B goes to B, uh, something like this, S little B, right, or something yeah. simple like that. Um, and then because the key is you want to do this and then write what you, ex before you run your program, right, that's the key to make your own test cases. Right, you create this test case, and of course, if you're doing it right, uh, you would first have on the first line S A B, a pound, this pound, that pound, pound, a pound, and then finally a double pound, right? Um, so I would try something like this, right? But before you run it, you want to use this as the test case and then output what you expect for tasks 0, 1, and 2, right? That shows that you know what it should be doing. And then you run your program on it to compare it with your output. So that's the big thing is to make sure that your expected output matches what your program actually outputs, right? If you just use this as input, run it into your program, and just look at the output and be like, yeah, yeah, that's what it should be, right? Then you're <coughs> confirming the bias that's in your own program. Uh, I would do things like this. I'd also read through the description and say, okay, am I testing all of these things, right? Where, for instance, the description says, uh, you know, in between any of these characters, there can be any white space, right? So are you testing with spaces, new lines, tabs, uh, you know, all kinds of crazy things? Or can the hash be on the separate line, uh, multiple lines after the hash, you know, all kinds of that kind of stuff. Uh, that's what I would do is go through the description, specifically look at every piece and be like, okay, does my test case actually test that? Like even just testing something like with, um, uh, for instance, one of the requirements is that, you know, all the string matching and everything is case sensitive, right? So if I have uh, like a non-terminal foo here, and then in my grammar I have like foo goes to capital foo, right? Does it properly know that those are two different symbols? All those kinds of things. So that's that's one thing to do. The other thing to do is, and I kind of wrote this this morning on the mailing list, you want to look and see, it's kind of difficult because unless your code's going to hit that, it's hard to tell, but you want to look through your code. A, look for any, is it possible that I have any null pointer dereferences, which are going to cause segmentation faults? Because you could miss a test case for three reasons. Well, yeah, three reasons, mostly. One is it's just straight wrong. The thing that you output is not the thing that we're checking for, right? One is uh, your program causes a seg fault before it outputs, right? 
so seg fault dereferencing a null pointer, dereferencing either the, the star operator or the arrow operator. So is, there, is it possible in your program for there to be a null pointer dereference? So then even if you calculate first and follow correctly, right, you're hitting that condition and your program's crashing before it outputs anything. So it's the same as if it outputs nothing. Um, third option, yeah. Would it pass the local test if you don't get those happening? It depends. I mean, it depends on if your local test cases are exercising all possible paths through your program, which I'd say probably not, right? It could be a case of you're checking if something's null, then you're doing something, but that test, that code is never executed on your local test cases. So this is why it's important to write a varied set of test cases for yourself. And I'm totally okay, well, let's establish some ground rule. Okay, let's, let's go back to the third one. Uh, the third one would be an infinite loop. Right? If your code gets into some infinite loop, for instance, if you're trying to calculate this first set recursively, right, it's going to get an infinite loop. And this will crash, but if you think about even an infinite loop, right, we're only running your code for so long. I think it's only three minutes, or actually, I actually don't know what it is, probably 30 seconds. Um, so if that's the way, if it's running forever, we kill it, and we say, okay, that's the same thing as doing no output. So those are the three main possibilities. Um, so here's what I will say. I'm fine if you want to share on the mailing list test cases, but not, it's tricky, because I don't want it to be like, oh, this test case passed, like once I solved this, then I solved the thing on the server, right? Like, I don't think that's fair for everyone, right? But if you just say, hey, here's a test case that I made, I think that's totally cool. And like, here's what I think the expected output is, and then other people can compare and, and decide what the expected output of that should be. I think that's totally fine. If you want to do that, I'm fine with that. Just as long as it's not like, oh, I passed test case X, or I was missing the last two test cases, and then I came up with this test case, and it caused a bug, so I fixed it, and now. Does that make sense? Okay, any other questions? Oh, now it's been 10 minutes. Cool. All right. Now back to program. Okay. So pointer operations. So we've talked about pointers a bit. So what does the address operator do for pointers? What's the semantics here? <coughs> Anything. Anything about the semantics, does it? In terms of box. Yeah. Almost. Close. Very close. How, let's start from the beginning. How many parameters does it take in? <coughs> One parameter. Uh, it's a unary operator. Uh, what can it be applied to? L values, R values? Like if you think about types like that? Only L values. Only L values. Why only L values? Uh, let's think about that for a second, because it only returns an R value. I don't know that I can get on board with that. I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to think of a counterexample. Um, so what does it return? An R value, right? Yeah, perfect. Uh, somebody else said something? Yeah, so the return value is the address of the box, right? So yeah, it takes in a box and it returns the address of that box as an R value. Um, so what about with types? So we think about the types. So if the type of the input parameter is T, some abstract type T, what's the return type going to be? The type of the, so let's say it's a T, let's call it an int to make it a little bit more concrete, right? So we, on, we do the address of operator on an int, what's that resulting return value? Uh, always an address, no matter the type. Uh, it's always an address, no matter the type, in the type system. So it is an address, and the addresses are usually shown in hexadecimal. Um, but what's, so if we were to use that variable, what's the type of that variable? Void. Hmm? <coughs> void. Not void. We good though. So first, why is 
can't return back an R value and not an L value. Yeah, another way to put it right, there's no location associated with it, right? It's just returning the address of some other location, or the memory address of some other location. So if we take the address of an int, then what do we get back in the, the type system? A pointer to an int. Yeah, it's an int star. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. So it's an R value. Right? But this R value has the type, just like normal R values, like the immediate value 5 in your program has, I assume the type int actually, but it could be any number of types, but let's call it an int. Right? So the key point is this is the address of the location. So we kind of have to change a little bit how we're doing box search. Uh, not change, we're just going to add. So we have x, right? It has some location with something in it. And if we take the address of x, right, so here we have uh, the variable name. Let's, so this is the, what do we call this? The binding, yeah, so we're binding x to this location. Uh, this is going to be the value in x, we'll call it 10. And then on the right hand side here, we're going to have some address where this memory location lives. It could be, you know, a hex value, uh, I don't know, like BF, FF, 4042. <coughs> or we could call it something abstract because we don't really care what the actual value is, like alpha. We can just say, yeah, it says alpha. So then when we take the address of x, what's this R value that this returns? Alpha. What was it? Alpha. Alpha, yeah, either alpha or whatever this <laughs> value is, right? Alpha pointing to the value of x or the location? <coughs> okay, so the first way to think about it, so this return value of the address of operator, is it an L value or an R value? So does it have a location associated with it or no? It's an R value, right? So this is just the mechanical value, basically. It doesn't, so this is actually why we're doing this and going through this, because pointers and pointing and dereferencing and multiple pointers, um, they actually are nothing but values inside of them, right? So if we had, let's say, we had some variable y, and we said y is equal to the address of x, right? So I have my box circle diagram here for y. So what are the exact semantics of this operation? So we went over assignment semantics. So what are the exact semantics here? What does this mean? Y is equal to the address of x. Set the uh, value bound to y equal to the address of x. Yeah, so we got to break it down a little bit, right? So on the left-hand side, is this an L value or an R value? Oh. Yeah, it better be an L value, right? Because we can't have it. And on the right, address of x is what kind of a value? R value, right? So the address of x returns an R value. So this is the same thing as saying y is equal to 5, right? Except that instead of 5, now it's computed based on the address of x. So we look at, OK, whatever this value is here. Uh, so let's actually use this concrete value because I kind of like that, except now I'm going to run out of circle space. So what's the result? Uh, so then what does the semantics mean here? <coughs> yeah, so take the address of x, right, which is some r value, which we can easily look up. Every location has some address. And then we say, take that value and copy it into the location associated with y, right? So this would be 0x, bf, f, f, 4, 0, 42. So what's the difference between y and x here? Nothing, really. The only thing that's missing is the value that's stored. Yeah, right? Inside that location, there's no difference. It's just a value. It'd be the same thing. Uh, 
you know, is this some special value? No, it's just some decimal. Yeah. So you're saying if you printed Y, it would actually print 10, or would it print that? Mm. Tricky question. Ah, uh, OK. So we print out Y. Do something like this. We're kind of doing <laughs> types right now. So, what is this accessing? Yeah. Y. So, value in Y. It says print out as a, what does the D mean here in the printout? Integer. Yeah, print it out as, a, as an integer, whatever is in Y. And you know what this is as, as an integer? Use a calculator. Yeah, FF 40, 42. I wish I had done this beforehand so I could have tricked you all into thinking that I know this really well. No? <laughs> that would be fun. Uh, so it actually depends, I guess, on how we're interpreting this number. Uh, because of the one here, this could be a two's complement number, but let's say it's not. It's a, uh, we're printing out a normal integer. So this would be. 3,221,176, wait, 221,176,363. So it's going to output. Is this any different than saying, can we do this? Can we say int z is equal to, maybe this is, we're calculating how much money I want to make. Maybe in pennies, but still. Right? I'm going to add commas, even though you can't really do that in a normal language. Right, so what does this mean? What is this? What are the semantics here? Exactly the same. Yeah, it's exactly the same, right? It's take whatever this value is here and copy it into the location associated with z. So we need to have z. We need to have some binding to some location. And then inside that, we put. Three two two. I wish I'd used a different address. Uh, one seven six three eighty six. Right inside there. And what's the address of Z? Beta. Yeah, beta. Gamma. We don't actually care at this point, right? It doesn't matter. So if we were to say, is Y equal to Z? Yeah. Right. This hex is just a different way of representing this same integer. Right? This is why the calculator is nice, because it shows us the exact 32 bits, ones and zeros of this number. Right? So we can see that, yeah, this and this are exactly the same. So if we ask the computer to compare these two, they'd say it's identical. Right? So to the computer, it doesn't matter that this is the address of x and that this is an integer. All it is is these are values in the locations associated with y and z. But when does it matter, actually, an address in there or not? When we try to use it as a pointer? Yeah, when we try to dereference it, right? When we try to do the dereference operator. So what are the semantics here? So how many parameters does it take in? One. Uh, so, so can the input, so the input can, I guess this is kind of uh, two questions. So the input can be either an L value or an R value. Uh, if it's an L value, it takes the value within there. If it's the R value, it's the R value. Uh, what does it return, <coughs> an L value or an R value? Where can you use the, can you use the dereference operator on the left hand side? So let's try to, <coughs> try to think about this. Bless you. Can I do this? Is this valid C code? Yeah. So because I can do this, what does this mean that the result of star y must be? Yeah, it's got to be an L value. Right. So the question, I guess, is, is it always an L value, or is it sometimes an L value, sometimes an R value? Um, so it's always an L value, right? It doesn't matter what you do. Star Y is going to return a location. So an R 
nomenclature here, a box. And the type, sorry, uh, the type here, right, we have, so as far as types go, let's say the input to y, uh, let's say y is a t star, we have t star y, then what's the type of star y? T. T. Yeah, right, that's how we get rid of those pointer references. So then what are the actual semantics here? So, so here we have, I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to go back up here, okay. I'm going to erase all this. All right, let's do star y is equal to, what number do you guys want? Number less than 100. One? One? So boring. <laughs> and it's easily mistook for an L. Okay. All right, so we have star y is equal to 1. So what are the semantics? So on the right hand side we have what? R value, L value? On the right hand? Mm -hmm. We have an R value. Yeah, it's an R value, right? There's no location that says this is just the value one. Right? So then star y is going to return an L value, a location. So what is it going to return? What are the semantics here? Kind of intuitive. So is intuitively what's going to happen to this diagram after the end, after this the, is the executed. Ten X will be a one. The 10 at x is going to be a 1. Yeah. But how does that actually happen? So star y, what does star y do? It's dereferenced. So it goes to the... We're defining dereference. It, it you can't use dereference. It goes to the location of the value at yeah, so it uses the value in the location associated with y, right, this value here. It takes this value and it looks up what location is associated with that, right? And it returns that location, it returns the box. So that star y, right, this expression mm, returns this box. Do we care that this box is also bound to the name x? No, we don't care at all. And then once we have this location, so now we just have an l value is equal to an r value. Can we know what to do here? Yep. Yeah, we just take this one, we copy it into the locate in the value in the location associated with the l value, which is right in here. We're going to change this from 10 to 1. And that's all pointers are. Right? They actually are absolutely nothing special or scary until we get to the dereference operator. And then it's just take whatever value's in y, look up that value, and return that, that L value. So what's the... So what's the difference between that and this? Yeah, so this, so the important thing to keep in mind, especially when you're programming, uh, when you're looking for null pointer dereferences, right? So this is equivalent to, it's actually uh, usually something like y plus offset. So what type, what type is y usually if you use this? Like what type is the pointer of y? struct, right? So you're trying to access a, so structs are just fixed chunks of memory that say, hey, group these fields together all at once. Um, so that every time you refer to some structure, uh, let's call this bar, and so if we have a struct, uh, let's call it bar, it has, let's say, an integer foo, let's call it something else first. Uh, we'll go baz. <laughs> and then an integer bar, a uh, foo, sorry. So this means, okay, every bar is 
two integers together contiguously in memory. And so I know when I'm accessing foo, so bar, the pointer to a structure points here, right, is the address here. And so I know, okay, at that address is going to be baz. The first four bytes is baz. The next four bytes are foo. And so the compiler automatically translates this y arrow foo into y plus some offset. Here it's going to be 4. So it'll be y plus 4 and then dereference that. So that's how it's able to index into the structure. Anyways, the point is when you're programming that if, so let's look at an example. So what if I said this? If I did y <coughs> is equal to null and then I did star y is equal to 100. What's this going to do? So first, what does this do? So let's draw this picture. So after this first line, what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing? <coughs> it's going to say what? The value. The value, which value? Why is just the name? The value at y. The value found. The value in the location associated with y. Yes. Semantics. This is why this is so fun. Um, right. So y is equal to null. But what is null? It's a, yeah, it's a preprocessor macro. Uh, what is it usually? Zero. Yeah. So the preprocessor goes through, replaces all nulls with zero. So this is equivalent to writing y is equal to 0. So then after this executes, what's the value that's going to be in the location associated with y? 0. So when I do star y is equal to 100, what's it going to do? You're going to have bad time. What's it going to try to do? Yeah, before it changes though, what is it going to do when it does the left hand side here? Star y is equal to 100. Yeah, so it's trying to, it's going to try to find a location with, do we know anything about the value there? What do we know about this location? The address is 0, yeah. I'm going to do like a weird, not a null set, but like a weird 0 there. So it's clear that this is the value. Right? So it's going to try to look up this location. Most times in your program, this location is not going to exist. And that's when the program throws a segmentation fault. It says, oh, I tried to access some memory that you have, are not using. And so this is an error in your program. This is where a segmentation fault comes from. So pretty much this whole thing, it goes, eh, can't do this, therefore I can't set that to be 100. If you had something at 0, if you had some location at 0, then it works. It just <coughs> will change whatever's there, as we saw, to 100. So you can completely control that. Actually, uh, kind of a funny story. Well, this is actually a big uh, security vulnerability, um, or it used to be more so, uh, because it used to be that you could trick some programs to allocate something at memory address zero, and so no pointer dereferences, you could get it to like write certain bytes into the program at memory zero, and you could use that to uh, completely mess with the program. Uh, but now most, I think on most systems, trying to access zero completely fails, yeah. Well, if you did one, or why you this? Exactly. Yeah, so what's going to be inside this location associated with y? 100. 100, yeah. And then now if you did star y is equal to, we'll do another number, 42. So what's this going to try and do? Yeah, it's going to try to find some location that has the address 42 and then, or sorry, the address 100. Yeah, good catch. 
right? It's going to try to return that L value. If it can find it, then it will return it, and everything will work. If it doesn't, then it won't work. Um, yeah, so this is why the star accepts either an L value or an R value, because you can do pointer arithmetic, and you can change where pointers point to when you're dealing with an array, right, and C. Iterating through that pointer is simply incrementing that pointer or offsetting from that pointer. Cool. All right, so let's. Okay. Okay, so we've seen this, right? So if we have some t, it actually doesn't matter whether it's a t star or a t or whatever the type of that variable is. Every variable is going to have a box circle diagram with some name associated with that, uh, bound to that. And it should, if everything's going correctly, it's going to have some value inside of that. And for everything to be type checked correctly, xv has to be, has to be some address, right, of a location that exists, right, some box that actually exists. And the type of that value that's inside there should be, uh, should be type t, right? So x is a t star. This means I dereferencing that. That thing should be a type t. So this means when you have a, if x is an int star star, when you dereference that, it should be an int. Right, it should be an int star. D reference only removes one of the pointers from there. And so another way we'll draw this is that, okay, this xv, if we take star x, points to this memory location. Um, so that's kind of what we've been doing as we do that, but we can draw it actually on the diagram. And so as xv, the value that's inside the location associated with x changes, then what happens to star x? It's also going to change and point to some other location, some other value. Okay. So, we have our L value, right? An L value, if there's a location associated with it, and our values have no location, so they're just values. Uh, so is star x an L value? How do you know? <laughs> yeah, so how do we know? associated with it, this box. So what about star x? Well, star x returns a location. So is there a location associated with star x? Yeah. It depends on what side it's on. It's on the left or right. Does it? Yeah. All right, so what's the right criteria for an L value? if there's a location associated with it, right? So if star x returns a location, then is there a location associated with star x? Yeah. yeah. It's definitely an L value, right? Doesn't matter where it appears. And so what's going to happen here if we do star x is equal to 100? How's this diagram going to change? V turns into 100. V is going to turn into 100, right? So we're going to take the value in the location associated with x, which is xv, we're going to look up, are there any locations with that address? Yes, there's this one. Here's this location. And so we're going to set the value in that location to be 100. Uh, so it's going to copy the value 100 to the location associated with star x. right? And we know that star x has a location associated with it. We just saw that. Uh, so we're going to end up writing 100 and changing that value. Questions? All right. 
Let's look at an example. Okay, so we have int x and int z. So, <coughs> how many circle box diagrams are we gonna have here? Two. Two. X and z's. <coughs> and then we say z is the address of x. And okay, we'll say the address of x is y. Right? So is y a variable? No, no. Oh, it's just some abstract address, right? It doesn't matter what we put there. It could be pretty much anything. So in the semantics of this, right, we're going to take that address, y, and we're going to copy it into the value associated with z. So what happens when we do this? Address of x star is equal to 10, or star address x equals 10. How do we figure out what's going to happen here? Yeah, so first, so address of x, what is it going to return? Y. Y? And what type of value is that? L value, R value. R value. R value, right? There's no location associated with that. Y does not have any location associated with it. It's just an address of a location. So we take Y, right? And can we do star Y? So what would star Y do? Going to, what, what is star y going to return in the diagram? Y is defined. Yeah, but y is a value, just like 10 or 100, right? Oh, so it would return the value of as a value location y? Yeah, so it's going to look up and say, are there any, okay, I know the address I'm looking for is y. Are there any locations with the address y? And it's going to return that location, that box. Exactly. And so then where is 10 going to go? In x, the location associated with x. Yes, into the location. 10 is going to get copied into the location associated with x. So what's this the same thing as doing? It's just saying x, x equals 10. x equals 10. So in theory, they undo each other? Uh, when you have them stacked like this, yes. Could you stack them the other way? Hmm? Could you stack them the other way? Or would that just be garbage? You mean in this? So if we stack them the other way? Yeah. Switch it? Um, so if we work outside in, let's... Uh, Here we had x, and we had, let's say the value in there is 10, and we have the address of x is y. So is this valid? I want to say no. You want to say no. How am I going to read that? Which happens first on the left hand side here? The um, dereference operator. Yeah, the dereference. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like this, right? I mean, if we were to parenthesize this, right? Star x first and then take the address of that. So what's star x going to do? Look at the location associated with 10. Yes, return the location associated with 10. It's going to try to find some location 10. Right, try to return that. Let's say, let's say for argument's sake that it works. Right? Then what's the address of this going to return? What's the address of this location? Ten. Wherever ten. 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 Or whatever is inside of ten. But then how does so then what do we do? Change this to hundred? Yeah, so remember, what is the 
R value of the address of anything, what does that return? An R value. Right, this is just a value. So the address of star x, we can take that, right? That would give us 10, assuming we can actually dereference 10. Right, that's kind of the trick. But it's an R value. So in essence, we're saying, can we do R value is equal to 100? No. And hopefully it shows that, like, look, there's nowhere to put, where do we put this 100? Right? The address of star x is 10. Right? Can you write a program as 10 is equal to 100 as an assignment statement? No. No, it doesn't make any sense. There's no place to put 100. Right? You can do a weird, like, type def or maybe, like, a pound define to say that 10 is 100 if you really want to mess people up. That's actually one of the fun things you can do to people's code. If you do like a pound, you can do like a pound define zero as one. <laughs> it'll completely mess them up. But it'll usually still compile if you do this. So you can do this like at the, sneak it into their code. Anyways, <laughs> don't do that on your students in this class or your fellow students in this class when they're trying to do their assignments. Cool. So we saw this. So then what happens when we do this? Can we do this? We say x is equal to star address of x. So what's going to happen here with star address of x? It's also x equal to x. Yeah, so what's address of x going to return? Y. Y. And star of y? Ten. What does star return? The dereference operator? Not the address 10, which address here? Y. The address. y. And what is it going to return specifically? The location. the location, the box. Yes, remember the location is not the value that's inside that location. Right, so it's going to return the box. And then we say x is equal to some L value. So we have L value is equal to L value. Do we know what to do there? Yeah, we take the value in the location associated with star address of x, which is this box. We take that value 10, and we copy that where? The location. Into the location associated with the name x, which happens to be the same thing. So we copy 10 into 10. And we're done. Did you say that star returns the location, but not the address? Yes, star always returns location. Star takes in an address and returns a location. And the other way is uh, the address of operator, right, takes in a location and returns the address. Okay, let's make a complicated example. Ooh, but first we need to cover something. New locations. Ah, where's my notepad? malloc and new. So let's, we'll just focus on C for now, because new actually I think under the cover just uses malloc. Um, right, so we have malloc, but how else do we create space for variables? Well, if they're on the stack, we declare it. Yeah, we declare the variables, right, when we declare. So um, we're actually going to go super in depth into the differences here between malloc and essentially we'll call it the stack for now. Um, right, so we have these two ways that we can create a name for variables. So if we do something like if I have some code and I have uh, int x here, well, uh, let's call it an int pointer x. So where is x living? Is malloc or the stack? Stack, right? So after this declaration, I know that the computer is going to create something with the name x and bound to some location, right? What's the value inside x? Garbage. Yeah, garbage. We don't know what it is. It's undefined, right? Do we know the address of x? Not at this time. We don't know it, 
But the, the at runtime, the computer is definitely going to know. We'll call it alpha for now. Right? Then if I say x is equal to malloc, so what are the parameters to malloc? It's just size, right? So how many bytes do you want to store things in? So how many bytes do I want in here? Yeah, why do I want so I could do this or I could do what's the difference between the two? One's portable, one's not. Huh? One is portable, the other is not. Yeah. How many, how big are integers on 64-bit systems? 64 bits. 64 bits. Yeah. Uh, and not four bytes, right? So this is the number of bytes. So it would be eight bytes, right, for an int. So if you try to write this code, it's going to fail on, it can fail in unsurprising ways on 64-bit operating systems. And at, the cool thing is, at compile time, the compiler translates size of int. The compiler knows when it's compiling exactly what architecture it's compiling for. And it knows how many bytes an int takes. So it actually, on 32 bits, it creates this call. And on 64 bit, it knows and it's going to create the equivalent malloc 8. So when you actually look at the binary code, it's actually using a number and it's not looking it up at runtime. Uh, but it's, this is why you use the compiler to do that job. OK, so let's say we've done this correctly. And for our purposes right now, it doesn't really matter what we pass in here because we're talking about locations as abstract things, right? We don't really care at this point how the size of the values that can possibly fit inside this location, right? But that's clearly determined by the number of bytes. So what does this do? What does malloc add to our picture? Uh, Without doing this, what does malloc do? Yeah, so maintain that memory. So what does it create then in our circle box diagrams? It replaces the garbage value with the valid <coughs> memory location for mm, too much. What if we just did this? What does Malik do? It uh, returns a memory location that we can put things in. How do we represent things that we can put things in? Places. Pointer to the box. The box. Locations, right? That's all it is is location. A location just have memory addresses associated with them, right? So this is going to create some new location. Do we know what the value is inside that location? No, we have no idea. Um, it has some address. We'll call it beta because we don't know it at runtime either. Right? It could be anything. And every time we call malloc, so this is what malloc does, is it creates a new, a new location. And so what does the call to malloc return? The address of that location. The address of that location, exactly. So here in this case, it would be beta. right? And so if I said x is equal to malloc, this is the exact same thing. So if I had x is equal to beta, where beta is, is this a variable? No, it's an address. Not just a value, right? Some value. So if I said x is equal to some value, what do you do? What, what are the semantics here? Copy. Yeah. Take the value beta, copy it into the location associated with x. So put x, put beta here. So if beta happens to be the address that malloc creates, so malloc returns beta, then what are the semantics here? Return value is, uh, I gotta look, I think it's like a void pointer technically, but the return value is just an address, right, which is a value. And so we say, okay, take that value and put it in the 
location associated with x, so we put it in here, right? So now where, after I do this, where does star x point to? The location at beta, yeah, exactly. Say again? X is an address. X, well, X is a name. So what's in the location associated with X? An address. But it's just a value. It's just a number. That number just happens to be the return value of malloc that actually created some space. So, okay, when we come back, we're going to uh, super cool examples like what does this do? <laughs> By the end of this, you're going to be able to do all this in your sleep and be pointer ninjas.